was the Garden of Eden located? Many Christians believe the Garden of Eden was located in the Middle East, where today we see the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. However, that could not be so. In fact, we have no idea where the Garden of Eden was located on this earth. And let me share with you why. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10, we read about a river that went out of Eden to water the garden. And then that river was divided into four rivers. Now, the names of two of those rivers are given as the Tigris and Euphrates. However, when you look at the Tigris and Euphrates today, we don't see four rivers coming from one. That means that these could not be the same rivers. Well, why do they have the same names? Well, think about this. When the settlers from England came to Australia, they used names they knew from England in Australia to name cities and rivers. That's why we see the same names today in those two different countries in certain instances. The same is true in America as well. Well, when Noah landed in the Middle East, the Bible says that Noah's Ark landed in the mountains of Ararat, and now that area today known as the Middle East, we do see names such as the Tigris and Euphrates, similar to the names in the pre-flood world, but that doesn't mean they were the same rivers. It just means that Noah or his descendants used some of those same names they were familiar with before the flood to name places after the flood. Now, there's also another important fact to consider, which would also help us understand there is no way we would know where the Garden of Eden was originally located. You see, Noah's flood was a global event. It would have destroyed the earth. We also believe that there was one continent before the flood. We read on the third day of creation that God gathered the waters together into one place. Presumably the land was in one place. And that land would have been so destroyed by the flood of Noah's day. We believe that that continent split up during the flood to form the continents that we have today. There is no way we would know where the Garden of Eden was originally located. And under that area of the Middle East today, we see thousands of feet of sedimentary deposits, fossil bearing deposits, flood deposits, those sediments were deposited by the flood of Noah's day. So there's no way the Garden of Eden could be on top of those fossil bearing sediments. So where was the Garden of Eden located? We have no idea where the Garden of Eden was located, but we do know that the Garden of Eden definitely existed. Did Bible authors believe in a literal Genesis? Did the Bible authors believe in a literal Genesis? When we think about that question, we realize that there are many different kinds of literature in the Bible. There's poetry, there are parables, but much of the Bible is historical narrative. And so when we come to Genesis 1 to 11, we want to ask what kind of literature is this? We could look at the internal uh, evidence within Genesis 1 to 11 itself. We could look at what the church has believed about those chapters throughout history. But I want to consider what did the biblical authors and Jesus himself believe about those chapters. In Numbers chapter 12, God tells us that he spoke to Moses face to face, not in dark sayings, but clearly. And so we should expect, as we read Genesis 1, that this is not mysterious writing. When we look at the Old Testament authors, uh, we see that they consistently treat Genesis 1 to 11 as straightforward history. For example, the uh, genealogies in 1 Chronicles 1 through 8 confirm the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11. When we look at the Psalms, we see in Psalm 33 that uh, the, the psalmist emphasizes that God spoke and it was done. He created and it stood fast. We also see in Psalm 136 a recounting of the history of Israel in poetic form. Every line, every other line is a, a poetic refrain and the uh, alternate lines are giving history and some of those statements are referring to creation. In Isaiah 54 and in Ezekiel 14, the prophets refer to Noah along with Daniel and Job, clearly taking all of those men as historical people. Then when we come to the New Testament, we look at the writings of the Apostle Paul. And in Romans chapter 5, he built his doctrine of uh, death and salvation on the fact that through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And Jesus came to solve that problem of death and sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says the same thing. We also see some other places where Paul refers to those early chapters. 
For example, in 1 Corinthians 11, he affirms that Adam was created first and then Eve, and that Eve was made from Adam. And then we have a very important passage in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where Paul talks about the whole creation bearing witness to God. And he says, uh, since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen through what has been made. That phrase, ever since the creation of the world, means that ever since God created, there have been human beings around to observe the witness of creation to the Creator. When we turn to Peter, three times in his two short letters, he refers to uh, Noah and the flood. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter, he mentions the fact that there were eight people saved in the ark. In chapter 2 of 2 Peter, he talks about Noah and Lot and that they were righteous men in a wicked world that experienced judgment. In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter is talking about the second coming of Christ and he says that scoffers will reject the second coming of Christ because they reject the creation and the flood of Noah. And so Peter builds his uh, teaching about the second coming on those two foundational truths. Then consider Jesus Christ himself. Eleven times in the Gospels he is recorded as saying, have you not read? And thirty times he said, it is written. And then he just quoted the scriptures. So his normal manner was to just take the scriptures in a straightforward way. In Matthew 19, when he was answering a question about divorce, he went back to Genesis 1 and 2 and talked about Adam and Eve as the first uh, marriage. In uh, Luke 11, he affirms that Abel was the first prophet and that he was martyred. And a most important passage is in Mark 10, verse 6, where Jesus is answering a question about divorce from the Pharisees. And he says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So in Jesus' mind, Adam and Eve were right back there at the beginning of creation. They weren't 14 billion years after the beginning, as the evolutionists would want us to believe. So when we consider how to understand Genesis 1, we need to look at how the biblical authors treated those chapters. The Old Testament authors, the New Testament writers, and Jesus himself took it as straightforward, literal history. And if we are faithful followers of Jesus, we must believe him and his word. Was there death before Adam sinned? When we read the account of creation in Genesis, we learn that it was Adam's sin that brought death into the world. If we take the Bible as written, it is very obvious that death, bloodshed, disease, suffering, animals eating each other, thorns, came into the world as a result of sin. However, if one believes in millions of years, as the secularists tell us concerning uh, the fossil record, then we have a fossil record laid down over millions of years before man that has evidence of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs, bite marks on their bones, evidence of diseases in the fossil record. We see animal bones with evidence of cancer, brain tumors, arthritis, abscesses and so on. And there are thorns in the fossil record said to be, oh, hundreds of millions of years old. Now the Bible makes it very, very clear that thorns came into the world after the curse. We're also told that originally before sin, Adam and Eve and the animals were all vegetarian. And we're told that God declared that the creation at the end of the sixth day was all very good. Very good uh, can only be defined in terms of how God sees good. And the Bible tells us that God is good and that God is perfect. And so a fossil record with diseases like brain tumors being described as very good certainly would not fit. In other words, it's the Bible's account of sin changing the whole world, changing the universe, that helps us understand why there's death in the world, why now animals eat other animals, why people even eat animals. Originally, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 and 30, Adam and Eve and the animals were all vegetarian, but that is not so today. The whole world has changed because of sin. In fact, Romans 8 tells us that the whole of creation groans in pain because of sin. As a Christian, one cannot consistently take millions of years and add that to the Bible. To do so, one would have to reinterpret the Bible's clear account in Genesis, which results in undermining the authority of Scripture. What about cloning and stem cells?
In my 20 years as a practicing physician, I've seen no technology or no advance in medicine that holds the promise of stem cell technology. Imagine, illnesses and infirmities that just a few years ago we thought to be untreatable are now potentially curable. However, at the same time, we're excited and we look forward to many, many advances in this field over the next few years. We must temper our excitement. We need to understand that these technologies are fraught with ethical problems and dilemmas. And the controversy really, really stems around the source or the origin of the cells themselves. Many people understand that there are embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are cells that are derived from the embryo. In other words, just a few days or the first few weeks after conception, we start with one cell, then two cells, then four cells. And these cells ultimately must differentiate or change into all the different cell types in the human body. The human body has almost 200 different cell types. So these early cells have the potential to differentiate or change into many different cells. To obtain embryonic stem cells, you must disrupt an embryo, which is a very genteel way of saying you must kill the embryo. We know from God's word that we're human from the time of conception. By that I mean the time of fertilization. So there is an ethical dilemma. Is it right to kill a person, to use those cells to potentially help another? However, using adult stem cells, we've been able to treat many, many different diseases and illnesses to this point. These cells are found throughout our body, and they're there to help the body heal, their repair mechanisms. They're there to help our body reestablish or replenish certain cell types as they're needed throughout our lives. These cells can actually be caused to differentiate into all the different cell types of the body. It's been said by proponents of embryonic stem cell therapy that these cells have the most potential, that we can really generate all the different cell types with embryonic stem cells. Actually, clinical research in the last few years has shown you can derive these cells from adult stem cells also. To be fair, there are problems with adult stem cell research. Adult stem cells are not found in as great a numbers in the tissues, uh, but they can be harvested and these technical problems have been overcome. To date, adult stem cell therapy has been used to treat over 70 different types of illnesses. And while we look forward to many advances in this area, we must understand the controversy centers around the origin of the cells themselves. Technology is wonderful. We need to always consider those among us who are infirm, who are sick, who are unwell. And certainly I've spent my professional life taking care of people. It's been my heart to care for the sick, to care for the wounded, to care for the injured. But the ethical dilemma comes down to this, is it right to kill a person to help another? And I think God's word's clear. Does evolution have a chance? Christians are often challenged to provide evidence for the existence of a creator God. I believe one of those evidences comes in the area of mathematics, specifically probability. Now probability is the measure of the likelihood that an event will occur. In other words, what we're talking about here is chance. What are the chances of an event to occur? Now, we use probabilities in many areas of our life. For example, probability is used in insurance companies. It's used in advertising companies. We see it all the time in gambling casinos. And it's also part of the evolutionary process. Now, here's the contrast we're talking about. The evolution worldview teaches as a fact that given enough time, molecules can evolve into a man. However, the Bible clearly teaches that God is the creator of all things. In other words, God created all life after its kind. So these two are in contrast. In other words, the two, both of these cannot be true. I believe we can use the area of probability to help us determine which one, creation or evolution, better matches reality or better matches what we actually observe out there. To do this, we'll use the origin of life, the first living cell. And to help illustrate this, we'll use just one of the components of a cell called a protein. Now, proteins are made up of what we call amino acids. Amino acids bond together to make biological proteins. So what we need to look at are the parameters that are involved in the formation of a single protein. And that will help us understand some of the probabilities involved in getting a single living cell. Now, one of these parameters is called the type of amino acids that are used in making proteins. There's over 300 different types of amino acids out there, but only 20 are used in life. That means life is very selective. If we get one of these wrong amino acids, the protein may not function properly. It could be very damaging to our bodies. A second probability problem deals with the shape of the amino acids. 
Amino acids come in two shapes. We call them left-handed amino acids and right-handed amino acids. And like our hands, they are mirror images of each other. Now here's the problem. Only left-handed amino acids are used in life. Right-handed ones are not used in life. So there's a second probability problem. The third problem deals with the order. These amino acids cannot be lined up in just any random order. They have to be in a very specific order so that protein can fold a specific way and perform its function. So the three problems we have here, number one, we can only use 20 of the over 300 amino acids that are available. Of those 20, we can only use the left-handed versions. And then they all must be in the correct order or that protein may not function properly. Now the human body is made up of all these cells which are made up of proteins. Proteins come in various sizes. They range in size from about 50 amino acids to over 30,000 amino acids. Now if we were to take an, just a very small protein, say a protein of about 100 amino acids, and ask what is the probability of that very small protein occurring by random chance processes? That probability would be 1 in 10 to the 130th power. That's one followed by 130 zeros. To help illustrate that, that immensity of that problem, if we were to flip a coin and we wanted to get heads all the time, for example, we wanted to flip a coin and get heads 100 times in a row, what would be that probability? How often would we have to flip that coin? In order to achieve this, we'd have to flip that coin 300 million times a second for over one quadrillion years. That's an immense problem for evolution to overcome, just to get a protein of 100 amino acids. Now, the human body is made up of about 60 trillion cells. How long would it take to assemble 60 trillion cells at one per minute? And that turns out to be about 114 million years. But that doesn't account for getting them in the right order. If we had to get them all in the right order, that would far surpass the evolutionary time frame of billions and billions of years. Now we go back to the human body, it is a tremendously complex organ, tremendously complex. For example, in our human body, we have about 40 billion capillaries. Those are the smallest of the blood vessels. If we were to take all those capillaries and line them all up, that would be about 25,000 miles long. We also have a heart that beats about 100,000 times a day. We have red blood cells that transport oxygen to our body. We have white blood cells that identify enemy agents in our body. We have eyes and ears that are more complex than any man-made machine. And we have a brain that has about 100 trillion connections in it. Now, if we were to take all 60 trillion of these cells and look at the probability of assembling all 60 trillion of these cells to form all these very specific complex organs that all interwork together, in the evolutionary time frame of 3.8 billion years, I think that probability would be beyond our comprehension. I believe that probability is a wonderful tool for showing that there indeed exists an all-powerful, all-knowing Creator God who tells us we are fearfully and wonderfully made and also tells us in Romans 1, 19 and 20 that He has given us all the evidence for a Creator God and we have no excuse. Did life come from outer space? Well, the simple answer to that is no. The Bible tells us that God created living things here on Earth on days 3, 5, and 6 of Creation Week. However, it's a popular belief in our society that life originated in outer space and was somehow transferred here to Earth, or that extraterrestrial aliens somehow brought life to Earth. And so what we see in our society is that people are willing to basically believe anything as long as it excludes God. So why do scientists push the origin of life into outer space? Well, there's two main reasons, complexity and time. And see, life here on Earth is very complex, and even the most primitive form of life, bacteria, are very complex. The simplest bacteria are known as endosymbiotes that live inside of other cells. And while their amount of DNA and number of genes is small, they have very complex interactions with their hosts. So even the simplest life isn't simple. The other reason is time, and so because life is so complex here on Earth, there is simply not enough time for it to have evolved through random chess processes of evolution in the supposed four and a half billion years that the Earth has been here. Uh, said scientists want to push it into outer space, which is supposedly 15 billion years old, so that there is enough time for it to have evolved and then been transferred to Earth.
So does life exist in outer space? Now, if life here on Earth originated from outer space, then we should be able to find evidences of that on planets, meteors, or comets, and billions of dollars have been spent searching for life in other places. Now, there are several likely candidates for where the life could have originated, and one of the possibilities is Mars. Many unmanned explorations have been sent to Mars, and we know that water likely has been found on Mars, but water does not equal life. And many other aspects of the Martian soil, like its salinity and acidity, make it unlikely that life could have originated there. Another possibility is the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, like Europa and Titan. They're believed to have interior oceans that could have harbored bacterial life. And organic molecules have supposedly been found on these moons. And the interior oceans are believed to be very violent, providing an energy source for life. But again, water plus organic molecules plus energy does not equal life. Life requires information like DNA, and information must have an intelligent source, and the only one intelligent enough is God. Now the next possibility are comets, and comets are believed to have liquid water interiors and, a, and an amino acid, which is a basic unit of a protein, has been found in comet dust, but again, water plus amino acids does not equal life. So it's very unlikely that life could exist in outer space because the conditions are simply too harsh. See, life comes from life, and life requires a life giver. Now, even if life could have originated in outer space, could it have then been transferred here to Earth? And we run into the same problems. Again, the, the conditions out of space are simply too harsh. The extreme cold and radiation would likely kill anything before it can make its way to Earth. Now, some people also believe that extraterrestrial intelligent aliens sent life to Earth, and the fancy term for this is directed panspermia. And Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel coined this term in a paper in 1973. And they believe that because life has evolved here on Earth, and Earth is only four and a half billion years old, that it's very likely that life has evolved in other places in outer space because it's 15 billion years old. Now, what is their evidence for this? And they, they believe that the universality or the similarity of the genetic code of all living things points to a common source. But what we see is that they are using their presuppositions that their ideas about the past reign supreme to God's. If we start with the biblical presupposition, we see that the universality and similarity of the genetic code comes from the fact that we have a common designer God that created all living things. Now, could God have created life on other planets? Yes, but why? God spent creation week fashioning the earth and getting it ready for his crowning glory, mankind. And everything that God created is for mankind's benefit and enjoyment. Even the microscopic bacteria that we can't see are for our benefit. They form symbiotic relationships in our gut to help us digest food and they're involved in nutrient cycling in the environment. Now, we can't rule out that God created non-intelligent life on other planets, but it seems very unlikely knowing the purpose of living things and their relationship with man here on earth as set in place by God. Vestigial Organs, Evidence for Evolution? Let's look at vestigial organs and, and what they are. Probably Charles Darwin himself was among the first to use this idea of useless organs in our body uh, as evidence of evolution. Robert Wiedersheim, back in 1896, uh, came up with 86 vestigial organs in the body. And uh, Wiedersheim's vestigial organs included the parathyroid, uh, and included the pineal, even included the pituitary gland, without which, of course, we'd be in very serious difficulty. But at his time, uh, functions were not known for these organs. And this is one of the problems with vestigial organs. Uh, what's the difference between an organ that truly has a function, uh, but we don't know the function from an organ that, let's say, has no function? So it uh, depends on our ego whether we're willing to say we just simply don't know the function or it couldn't have a function if I didn't know it. Uh, let's look at a few specific examples, critically, uh, of vestigial organs. Well, I think the most famous vestigial organ of all in our body is the appendix. That and the tailbone. We'll talk about both of them. What about the appendix? First of all, there really is no evolutionary story to the appendix. Uh, evolutionists say that uh, uh, it's a vestigial cecum. What's a cecum? 
This part of the large intestine that hangs down below where the small intestine enters is called the cecum. So the first thing we need to know is humans already have a cecum. So the appendix can't be a vestige of a cecum we used to have. Where is the appendix? Well, the appendix is right down here. If we can turn this perhaps a bit, maybe I can even pull this out. <laughs> We've opened up the cecum and this opening right here goes into the appendix. Now, is the appendix useless? <laughs> For many years, we thought, uh, people thought it didn't have a function. And so back in the 1900s, people would uh, cut out the appendix even when it was normal. Surgeons would often just grab the appendix when they were in the vicinity. Uh, but that's not done today. And uh, one thing that's come up just within the last few years is we now have a pretty good, very plausible function. The appendix appears to be a safe house in which bacteria can be harbored that are useful. And you might think bacteria are all harmful or not. We have certain bacteria that are useful for digestion. And uh, what can happen is in a bout of diarrhea or something, the large intestine can be purged of its useful bacteria and you need to get the good bacteria, the useful ones, back in the gut again. And it's believed that this little appendix structure sticking off to the side as it does out of the main tract is used to then re-inoculate uh, the intestine with the useful bacteria. What about the other often cited example uh, of a vestigial organ? Uh, that would have to be the so-called tailbone right down in here. It is not functionally a tail, and of course there is no empirical evidence that it ever did serve as a tail in human beings. And so uh, what then is this? Is it just useless? Is it just simply the end? Hardly. It's a very useful piece of bone. In fact, uh, if you rank ordered bone and how important bones were on how many muscles attached to it, coming from how many different directions, I think this little piece of bony real estate might win. Uh, it is the focal point for the attachment of all of the muscles that form the floor of what we call the pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm is a muscular bowl that attaches to the brim of the pelvis here and then converges and attaches to the coccyx. That's a better name for the tailbone, the coccyx, which really means a cuckoo's beak. It looks sort of like a cuckoo's beak. And uh, that muscular floor right where my hand is there now, that muscular floor holds the organs that reside in this lower part uh, of the abdomen and pelvis. And what organs are they? Well, let's take a look here. We'll pull out the liver, and pull out the stomach, pull out a few organs. Uh, we'll pull out the whole small or large intestine. And now we're down to that muscular floor. And sitting on top of this is the bladder, the structure here. In the case of a male, under the bladder, we have the uh, prostate gland. It's uh, way down in here. Uh, now you can see that bowl very nicely down there. In a female, the uterus would be here. Uh, and the end of the colon, the sigmoid colon, comes down into this region. Now, if we didn't have that muscular floor, because we stand vertically, uh, the first time we would go <coughs> like that, uh, whoopee, things could sort of just <laughs> go right down through uh, uh, this area, but that muscular floor holds everything in place. So, an exceedingly important bony structure. Not a useless, a leftover vestigial tail. Well, that's uh, my story on vestigial organs, and uh, I hope you've learned something new here. Thank you. the best argument for the existence of God? Well, the best evidence for the existence of God is that without God, you couldn't prove that anything existed. You couldn't prove anything at all, in fact. Now, there are many uh, lines of evidence that people sometimes use to demonstrate the existence of God, or at least to confirm the existence of God, and I don't want to minimize any of those. Certainly, it's, it's the case that the, the intricacies of a living cell certainly confirm God's existence. The uh, majesty of the solar system confirms God's existence. Even the effects of God in people's lives certainly are confirmation of, of God's existence. But it turns out that, that most arguments that people use for the existence of God are not 100% conclusive. And so it seems to me that the most powerful 
argument for God's existence is that apart from Him, we couldn't prove anything at all. You see, in order to prove things, we need laws of logic. What are laws of logic? Laws of logic are the chain of reasoning that we use, the correct chain of reasoning, to uh, come to various conclusions from certain premises, certain givens. And you see, we all know about laws of logic, and we use them every day. Even if we can't recite them, we all know them instinctively. You can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship, what we call the law of non-contradiction. Now, everyone uses that principle. It's, uh, it's very commonly known. And yet, you see that these laws of logic would not make sense in an atheistic universe. Why would we have these laws at all without a lawgiver? Why would the universe feel compelled to obey laws of logic if there's no God who's upholding the universe? You see, laws of logic in the Christian worldview make sense. They're a reflection of the way God thinks. And so we have these laws of logic that apply everywhere. They're universal. They don't change with time. And that makes sense because God, you see, upholds the entire universe everywhere, and God does not change with time. And so that is reflected in the way he thinks about things. And we can, in a sense, think like God, not completely, of course, but we can think in a way that is consistent with his nature because we are made in the image of God. And so we have access to these laws of logic by which we reason. Laws of nature would be another example of something that only makes sense if you take God's existence as something that is factually true. Why would we have laws of nature that the universe feels compelled to obey? Why do these laws have mathematical properties to them like E equals MC squared and F equals MA? Why is it they can be described by these simple equations that the human mind can understand? Well, that makes sense in the biblical worldview where God uh, has imposed a certain amount of order on the universe. God has made our minds and He upholds the universe in a logical way that we can understand. Laws of morality would be another example of something that really doesn't make any sense in an evolutionary atheistic universe. Why is it that we ought to behave in a certain fashion if we're just evolved animals, if the universe is just an accident? Why not make up our own laws? And of course, some people do that, and they go to jail for making up some laws that perhaps other people would say are not so good. After all, somebody might think that it's okay for him to kill someone else, but that doesn't really make it right, does it? Not at all. You see, in the Christian worldview, laws of morality make sense because, after all, there is a God who made us in His image and we're responsible to that God for our actions. And so morality stems from a Christian worldview. It makes sense in light of the biblical God. In a way, the existence of God is the easiest thing in the world to prove because, you see, it's something that everyone already knows. The Bible tells us in Romans 1 that everyone knows in his heart of hearts the biblical God because God has made himself manifest to everyone. God has showed, shown himself to everyone in the, in the creation, in our conscience, and so on. And so we don't have to go around and try to come up with some new argument. No, people already know God. That's not the problem. The problem is not that people don't have enough evidence for God's existence. The problem, according to Scripture, is that people suppress that truth and unrighteousness. That's what Romans 1 tells us. What is known of God is made manifest in them. God has showed it to them, and yet they suppress that truth in unrighteousness because they don't want to believe in a God who is rightly angry at them for their sin, for their rebellion against Him. And so you see, what our job is, is to, uh, is to show people that, uh, th that they're being inconsistent. On the one hand, they're relying upon things like logic and science and morality, things that only make sense in a Christian worldview while simultaneously denying the God that makes that worldview possible. What are some of the best flood evidences? If the flood really did occur, what evidence would we look for? You know, most people haven't even thought of that question, let alone thought of an answer. You know, the Bible says that the fountains of the great deep were opened, the rain fell from heaven for 40 days and 40 nights, the waters rose 150 days until all the high hills under the whole of the heaven were covered and the mountains were covered. And we're told that all land-dwelling, air-breathing life perished except for those on the ark. Wouldn't we expect to find billions of dead plants and animals buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? And that's exactly what we find. Billions of dead things called fossils buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. But let's expand on that. Let's look at six of the best evidences for the flood. Evidence number one, sea creatures buried high in mountains on the continents. That's right, marine creatures that live in the ocean are found in mountains like the Himalayas. How did they get there? Unless the ocean waters rose up over the continents. And we find marine creatures in rock layers all over the continents, everywhere around the world. Evidence number two, we'd find rapidly buried plants and animals. Well, we do, fossils. We find fossils not only of plants, but of bees, of bats. We find fish 
that are, uh, haven't finished having their breakfast eating another fish they're buried and fossilised. Ichthyosaurs giving birth to babies and they're fossilised. We find delicately preserved fossilised jellyfish. How do you fossilise a jellyfish slowly? Evidence number three, rapidly deposited sediment layers right across the continents. We find that everywhere we look. Look at the red wall limestone, full of fossils in the Grand Canyon. Yet the same limestone layer is found in the same position over in Pennsylvania, then over in England, and even in the Himalayas. The chalk beds, the White Cliffs of Dover, we find the same chalk beds in Europe, in the Middle East, over into Kazakhstan, we find the same chalk beds with the same fossils in Texas and the Midwestern United States. We find the same chalk beds in Western Australia. The coal beds of Pennsylvania and West Virginia are also found in, in England and Europe right across to the Ural Mountains. Evidence number four, long transport distance of sediments. The Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon. The sand grains are believed to have been eroded and washed from it far north as at least Wyoming. The Navajo sandstone in Zion National Park, those huge white cliffs, the sand grains are believed to have been eroded and washed all the way from the Appalachians right across North America. Evidence number five, rapid or no erosion between uh, sediment layers. Again, you think in terms of the uh, Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale, it's a, there's a knife edge, flat featureless boundary between those two rock layers for mile after mile through the Grand Canyon. Yet the geologists claim that there's 10 million years missing at that boundary. What would have happened during 10 million years of weathering and erosion? You'd get a topography, not a flat featureless boundary. The bottom of the Grand Canyon, the Tapete sandstone sits on the pre-flood rocks and we have evidence of huge erosion there with boulders being picked up from the underlying rock layers indicating rapid erosion. Evidence number six, we find whole rock layer sequences deposited rapidly in quick succession. Look at the walls of the Grand Canyon, from the tapetes at the bottom to the Kaibab limestone at the top, supposed to be representing 300 million years of slow and gradual sedimentary deposition. When the plateau was pushed up, those rock layers were bent and folded, but they were folded without fracturing. They had to be soft if they were bent without fracturing. That means that they could only have just have been deposited, but that means the 300 million years never happened. All those rock layers had to be rapidly deposited in quick succession during the flood year. So you see, when you ask the right question, you get the right answers. Who are we going to believe? The scientists who weren't there, who don't know everything, who sometimes make mistakes, or the word of God who was there, who saw what happened and told us what happened during the flood. And what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. Unicorns in the Bible? Many people think the Bible contains fairy tales because it mentions unicorns. But the biblical unicorn is not the cartoon animal that springs to our modern mind. The biblical unicorn is described alongside animals that we know and are familiar with. Lambs, lions, dogs, goats, and so forth. Unicorns show up in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Isaiah, and the book of Job. In Job 39, God is telling Job about an extensive list of very impressive animals that he's created. If God introduces an imaginary fantasy animal, the whole point of his illustration to Job would be lost. In Job 39, we see God describing goats, donkeys, horses, hawks, eagles, peacocks, ostriches, and the unicorn. God describes the unicorn as being an impressive, strong animal that's totally useless for man's agricultural needs because it can't be domesticated to pull a plow. Elsewhere in Scripture, we see the unicorn described as skipping like a calf, traveling like a bullock, and bleeding when it dies. Modern readers tend to stumble over the unicorn because we forget that the single horn is not that unusual a feature in God's design menu. Think of the rhinoceros or the narwhale. The fossil record cannot give us a definitive identity for the unicorn, but it does show evidence of large single-horned animals. One example is the elasmotherium, a 19th century discovery which is basically a very large rhinoceros. 
The elasmotherium has a skull 33 inches long, a skull which could easily support a massive horn. Linguistic comparisons between the Hebrew language, the language the Old Testament was originally written in, and Assyrian sometimes point out that the word translated unicorn is very similar in its transliterated form to the Assyrian word for aurochs. The aurochs was a two-horned, bull-like creature that was probably used by the Assyrian kings for sport hunting. Often in the Assyrian archaeological finds, the aurochs is pictured with its symmetrical horns in profile as just one horn. This same creature, the aurochs, was described by Julius Caesar in the Gaelic Wars as being a bull-like creature almost as large as an elephant and one whose horns were greatly prized for use as cups at feasts. The most impressive quality of the unicorn is its strength. In Deuteronomy, the unicorn's horns are used to speak of the prophesied strength of the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. In Numbers, the unicorn is used to point to God's strength. Though we can never know for certain the actual identity of the unicorn, its identity is not what's really important here. If we think of the biblical unicorn as a fantasy animal, we demean God's Word. God's Word, which is real and trustworthy in every point. Doesn't the Bible support slavery? Slavery has become a hot-button issue in today's culture. Oftentimes, critics of the Bible come to a Christian and they bring up the issue of slavery in an attempt to discredit the Bible. But here's the crux of the issue. When the Bible talks about slavery under the Mosaic Law in the time of Moses, uh, leading up to the time of Christ and that sort of thing, was that slavery the same as harsh slavery? The answer is a resounding no. The fact is, it was completely different. And I want to read you a passage here in Exodus uh, chapter 21, verse 16. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Now that's a pretty serious judgment on someone who is a slave trader who goes out and kidnaps people and uh, takes them into the slave trade to be sold uh, as a slave. Now, why would Moses bring up something like this? Well, what it is, Moses is trying to distinguish between harsh slavery and uh, the slavery that was going to un undergo uh, at the time of the Israelites. In essence, it was the first type of bankruptcy law. Now see, back in ancient times, if a person had lost themselves to debt, had become incompetent with their finances, really what happened is someone would say, I want to I wanna get paid, and they said, oh, we don't have the money. Well, fine, they'd throw you in jail till you paid it. Well, you didn't make anything when you were in jail, so by and large, you were just in jail for the rest of your life. A government didn't step in and pay your debt and that sort of thing. Uh, bankruptcy uh, is actually more of a modern invention. But what the Israelites did different, and this is what Moses wrote, was that if a person had lost themselves to debt, they could go to the person they were indebted to, or they could go to another wealthy person and say, I want to sell myself into slavery. This was a voluntary option. If that person said, okay, they would cover their debt, they would give them a place to live. They would train them in a particular vocation, whether it be carpentry or uh, bricklaying, that sort of thing. They would also make a wage. Now, it wasn't equivalent to our modern day minimum wage, but it was some sort of a wage. And so they could accumulate that. And you know what? After six years, they were set free on the seventh year. So really what it was, was it was taking somebody who had been incompetent with their finances, training them, getting them, getting them back, so that when they go back out into the society, that they would do a pretty good job. Now, I'll tell you what, this was really a wonderful law, and what it did is instead of the government coming in trying to help somebody out, it let other people help other people out. So it's really like servitude or a bond servant, which is the way a lot of Bible translations translate this instead of slaves. Now, there's a lot of regulations towards slave masters and slaves uh, themselves throughout Scripture. You might think of Leviticus 25, and, uh, which talks extensively about it, and there's other passages throughout the Bible in the Old and the New Testament. And the reason that these laws are in place is to keep this type of slavery from becoming the harsh slavery. And if Israel didn't have any rules and regulations, really what it would have done was open the door for harsh slavery, for harsh slavers to come in uh, to their nation. But the sheer fact that they had rules against it, first off, shows that it was sinful man in a sin-cursed world, because such things shouldn't have existed in a perfect world. But we're not in a perfect world. And by having those regulations, it prevented these other cultures from kind of taking over uh, the slave trade in that particular area. In fact, is it discouraged harsh slavery as well as uh, uh, harsh slave traders to come into that particular area. 
Now I want to sum this up with a few bullet points just to kind of give you a few reminders. First off, slavery in the Bible is not the same as harsh slavery that other people often think of, you know, which occurred here in the Americas or in uh, Europe, which are both terrible stains uh, to each of these uh, particular nations, say the United Kingdom or uh, uh, the United States of America. Now another bullet point on this is that it was a voluntary option. If somebody had lost themselves to debt, it was basically like a type of bankruptcy law. They would enter into that voluntarily. After the sixth year, they were allowed to go free. And here's another really strong bullet point that many people may miss, is that Christians themselves, even in today's uh, day and age, were the ones who led the fight to abolish slavery, say in the Americas or say throughout Europe. You might think of great Christians like Abraham Lincoln or William Wilberforce who fought to abolish harsh slavery. And that was the right thing to do because morally, harsh slavery is wrong. Just as a, as a last call, Christians, we should be leading the way on every moral issue. And so I want to encourage you to do that. How can someone start a new life in Christ? How can someone start a new life in Christ? Well, to answer that question, we must go to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It was a perfect world, a world where there was no death, disease, or suffering. God and man lived in perfect harmony with each other. Can you imagine that? Every need that man had was met by their Creator God. But you know, He didn't create Adam and Eve to be obedient puppets. He created them to have freedom to choose. Freedom to choose to love Him and to obey Him. He only gave them one rule, one command to live by. Can you imagine that? Just one rule. Genesis 2.17, He says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, ye shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, ye shall surely die. Well, Satan, who had already been cast out of heaven, came down to this earth to try to ruin God's perfect creation. He came in the form of a serpent and came to Adam and Eve and began to question what God had told them. Well, on that very defining moment, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve believed the lie of Satan. And unfortunately, they ate of the fruit of that tree and sin entered into the world. Everything that God had created perfect was now corrupt. And Adam and Eve now began the process of dying, not only physically, but also spiritually. The Bible tells us in Romans 5.12, But as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The scripture also tells us in Genesis 3.15, that God would send a sacrifice to die for the sins of the world somewhere in the future. And he made that promise to Adam and Eve to restore that relationship between God and man. Well, 2,000 years ago, the Bible tells us that God fulfilled his promise in Genesis 3.15. Romans 5.8 says this, But God demonstrated his love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The debt that you and I would have to pay for our sin was now paid by what Jesus did on the cross. But I have great news, Jesus didn't stay on the cross. He was buried in a tomb for three days. And after the third day, the Bible says that he arose. You see, he conquered sin and he conquered death now. First Corinthians 15 says, for as in Adam, we all die. Even so in Christ, we all shall be made alive. You see, without Christ, we're all dead men walking. But in him, we can be made alive. But you say, how can I be made alive in him? Well, the Bible says that we must receive that gift of eternal life. Romans 6.23 says this, For the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I would like to ask you first of all, would you like to start a new life in Christ? Would you like to receive this gift of eternal life? You say, yes, I would like to do that. I'd like to clarify some things of what that involves. The first thing is trusting Him. Trusting Him and what He did on the cross for the penalty for your sin. You're not trusting in anything that you're doing or that you've done to merit yourself to get to heaven, but you're trusting in what Christ did alone. The second thing is, we must repent. The Bible tells us that we must turn from our sin, turn from our wicked way, and begin to follow Him, and that's what true repentance is. The third thing is that we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. John 10, 9 says this, and this is Jesus speaking, 
He says, I am the door, and by me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved. And the last thing is, rely on God's strength. You know, some people are under the impression that if they become a follower of Christ, that everything's going to be fine and they'll have no problems, no challenges. But there's not a person in the Bible that ever lived in the Old Testament or the New Testament that didn't face challenges. But the, the difference was is they didn't have to face those challenges alone. Hebrews tells us this, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's Jesus speaking. That's a promise that he gives to us who know him as personal Savior. The book of John chapter 6 says this, Truly, truly, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That is God's promise to you. We want to share in your joy if you've made this life-changing decision. And we ask that you would please contact us at the information provided on this DVD and tell us your story. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Should Christians be pushing to have creation taught in government schools? To understand this question, we first need to think about the history of the Bible in the public school system in America. Initially, the Bible was used as a textbook, prayer was allowed in schools, and biblical principles of morality were taught to the students in the public education system. Today, we see that biblical Christianity has been kicked out of the public schools and has been replaced by the religion of secular humanism. John Dewey, one of the founders of the modern public education system, was a secular humanist, and he used his religious ideals to frame the public school system we know today. John Dewey was also a signatory on the first Humanist Manifesto. In the Humanist Manifesto, we read things like, the universe is self-existent and was not created, that man is the result of a process of natural chance occurrences over time, and that man is the measure of all things. In secular humanism, man has become God. Now, we know that evolution is also one of the fundamental tenets of the secular humanist religion, and that evolution is taught almost exclusively in the public school science classrooms. It's taught to the exclusion of ideas like biblical creation and intelligent design and the students are indoctrinated with the evolutionary ideas of the Big Bang, millions of years, and humans evolving from eight people. If it were mandated that creation were to be taught in the public schools alongside evolution, in the current system, evolutionists would be teaching the biblical creation model. These evolutionists would not present the biblical model in a balanced and, and fair way, but they'd present it in a biased way, supporting their own evolutionary worldview. And biblical creation would be taught as a pseudo-scientific myth, the same way that these, these scientists presented in the secular media and the textbooks today. Rather than mandating it be taught in the public school classrooms, the grassroots approach would see Christian individuals in various communities rise up to take positions on local school boards and other curriculum committees where they can influence the content of the teaching in the public schools. Christian teachers in the public schools can consider themselves missionaries in a hostile environment, as well as students in the public schools. Those people can be sharing the gospel with the people in the public school systems as the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed and people recognize their need for a savior and the authority of the Bible and how it should influence the thinking in every area of our life, then the Bible will again become the authority for people making decisions in our culture and in our society. As more and more individuals come to a saving knowledge of Christ and trust the Bible, that foundation will be restored in our nation and we can see the biblical creation model taught again in the public school systems as society as a whole changes. Was the flood of Noah global or local in extent? The question of whether the flood was global or local in extent is ultimately a question about the authority of the scriptures. After all, the scientists, the geologists in particular, declare that the earth is millions and billions of years old and there never was a global flood. 
Thus, many Christians say, well, it doesn't really matter. Let the scientists deal with the science. We'll just focus on the gospel. But we need to remember that if Genesis cannot be trusted, then how can we trust John 3, 16? It's a question of all of scripture or none of scripture. Now, the geologists say that the earth is millions of years old because they believe in slow and gradual processes over millions of years. Sure, they believe in local, local floods and local catastrophes, but never a global flood. Yet when we look at the language of the scriptures, the intent of what we read there with all the high hills under the whole of the heaven being covered with water, the waters rising for 150 days until the mountains were covered, certainly appears to be describing a global event. Now the context of the flood account in Genesis 1 to 11 is on the question of universal origins, the origin of the universe, the earth and everything in it, the flood and then on to the Tower of Babel and the origin of languages. The context is universal. Whereas when we go to Genesis 12 through 50, the focus is on Abraham and his descendants, the children of Israel, the origin of the, the nation of Israel. Therefore, in the context of universal origins, the flood is described as a global event. There are three chapters devoted to the flood account, and yet only two to the creation account. Therefore, the flood with three chapters must be very important. And again, the context declares that it was uh, global in extent. The Bible talks about all flesh corrupted its way. God said he was gonna destroy the whole earth. Why would he want to do that, destroy all the animals as well as man, if it wasn't to be a global event? I mean, the, the terms that are used there, as some of the Hebrew scholars have said, the spirit of the language, the intent is to describe a global event. And after all, if the Holy Spirit wanted to choose the words to give us that impression, then the Holy Spirit could have not have chosen better words to describe the extent of the flood. Now, there are theological problems too with this whole question. After all, if the flood was only local and the fossils are a result of uh, millions of years, then that means all the dead things, the fossils accumulated prior to man coming on the earth. That means, of course, that Adam and Eve would have been walking on a fossil graveyard. Yet the scriptures declare that God made a good earth. It wasn't until the curse that we find that death and suffering came into the world. Now this is starkly illustrated by the occurrence of fossilised thorns in sedimentary rocks in Canada that are supposed to be 400 million years old. This is a complete denial of the scriptures if that was 400 million years old because that means there was fossilised thorns for 400 million years before the Bible tells us that as a result of the curse, thorns and thistles came into existence. We need to remind ourselves that Jesus testified to the historic reality of the flood event. In the context of talking about the future judgment, which will be universal, he declared that in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking and marrying and the flood came and took them all away. He was talking about a universal, a global flood. The simile with second, in 2 second Peter chapter three, the apostle Peter talks about the last day scoffers who will deliberately reject the evidence for creation, the flood, and scoff at the second coming. The second coming will be universal. The creation was universal, was global. Therefore, in context, the flood was global. Now, after all, there are also scientific problems. Why would Noah have to build an ark the size that it was, 450 feet long, if, it, if he, all the animals had to do was to fly and migrate to another location? It doesn't make sense. Why tell Noah to preserve those animals on such a large boat if all they had to do was migrate away. So there are many problems with the denying that the scriptures are teaching it was a global event. So you see, this is ultimately a question about the authority of the scriptures. The scriptures declare the flood was global. Therefore, we believe that the flood was global and therefore the scientists who weren't there, who don't know everything, must be wrong about their declaration that there never was a global flood. God's Word is true and what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's Word. How old does the earth look? The Bible clearly teaches that the earth is young. When you look at those days in Genesis, the Hebrew word there is for a literal 24 hour day. When you add up the genealogies in Genesis, it comes to a 6,000 year 
history for the Earth. But to hold a young Earth view today, in today's world, is laughed at. It's very unpopular because the world believes that the Earth is four and a half billion years old. But does the Earth really look that old? Think about a fossil like a trilobite fossil in a sandstone. How did it form? Well, most people think in terms of sand grains slowly being washed by a river over long, long, long periods of time and eventually burying a critter like a trilobite. And so they look at a trilobite fossil and think in terms of millions of years. But you see, we need to recognise that the past was not observed. We weren't there to see the fossil, the critter buried and turned into a fossil. Most people think in terms of millions of years because they haven't thought in terms of catastrophe. But we do see catastrophes today. We see small scale catastrophes like floods, earthquakes and volcanoes, volcanic eruptions. And in fact, even local catastrophes today accomplish a lot of geologic work. Remember what happened at Mount St Helens? May 18, 1980, there was up to 600 feet of uh, sediments deposited. Then in March 18, uh, 1982, a mud flow came out of Mount St Helens and carved into those sediments a canyon, 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. And it all happened in less than a day. A lot of water, a little bit of time. So catastrophes are what accomplishes uh, a lot of geological work. The same with the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River. Most people don't realise that the Colorado River is not eroding any longer. And the headwaters of the Colorado River are at a lower elevation than the top of the plateau through which the canyon was carved. So the Colorado River couldn't have carved out the Grand Canyon. It needed a lot of water, a little bit of time. It needed catastrophic conditions. You know, the scientific community thinks in terms of millions of years because they believe it. They weren't there to observe the past. They only assume there was no direct observation. You know, the Apostle Peter predicted this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said that in the last days there would come scoffers who will be willingly ignorant of the evidence and will believe that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. In other words, everything has gone on slowly and gradually over thousands and millions and billions of years. And that's the belief called the uniformitarianism or the present is the key to the past and that's how most people think they think in terms of the present is the key to the past they're being brainwashed into thinking that things take a long time and therefore rocks and fossils take millions of years to form and therefore the earth is old so they think it looks old when it really isn't you see it all comes down to the fact of what glasses you're going to wear because it's what happens in your mind we don't observe the past, we only observe the present. So how can we explain how things formed in the past? We have to interpret the evidence in terms of a belief system. And are we going to believe therefore the words of the scientists who weren't there, finite fallible scientists who didn't see the rocks and fossils form, who say that everything goes slowly and gradually over millions of years, that makes the earth look really old? Or are we going to trust the word of God who was there, who knows everything, who never makes mistakes and never tells lies? Genesis is God's eyewitness account. And he tells us that he created instantly and that he caused the worldwide global flood. Jesus confirmed that when he said that the flood came and destroyed them all. So who are we going to trust? God or the fallible scientists? No, the world doesn't really look old. It's all in your mind. What glasses are you going to wear? Are you going to trust God's word or believe that the word of finite fallible men? When and how did the Grand Canyon form? The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long, varies from 3,000 to 6,000 feet deep and four to 18 miles wide. It's the only natural feature on the Earth's surface that can be seen from the moon. So how and when did the Grand Canyon form? Well, there's three undisputed observations. First of all, everyone agrees that the plateau was there before the Colorado River. But that creates a problem because you see the headwaters of the Colorado River at a lower elevation than the plateau itself. So how could the plateau, the water go uphill to carve out the Grand Canyon? And then everyone agrees on the scale of the erosion. 1,000 cubic miles from the canyon itself and 100,000 cubic miles of rock layers from above 
the rim rocks of the Grand Canyon. So how did the Grand Canyon form when it actually cuts through a plateau? It, it doesn't go around the plateau. In fact, the headwaters of the Colorado River are at a lower elevation than the plateau it cuts through. And everyone agrees that the plateau was there before the Colorado River got there and carved, supposedly carved out the Grand Canyon. Well, it couldn't carve out the Grand Canyon if it's at a lower elevation, its headwaters are at a lower elevation than the canyon itself. Now, there's always been a secular controversy about when exactly it formed, the Grand Canyon. The, the conventional geologists have argued whether it was 70 million years ago when the plateau was uplifted, or even as recently as six million years ago. They don't know. They also don't know how it, it formed. Originally, they thought that the Colorado River carved out the canyon slowly because the plateau rose slowly at the same speed and so it kept on cutting down as the plateau went up. But that doesn't work because of the dating and the plateau being there before the Colorado River was. So now they think, well, uh, there was a stream that, that eroded from the west through the plateau to capture the headwaters of the Colorado River that were then draining out through the Little Colorado River. But that doesn't make sense because you still have the same problems of what slow and gradual erosion can accomplish. But we do know that there is evidence there in the Grand Canyon of rapid and recent catastrophic erosion. For example, the debris from the Grand Canyon is not in the delta of the Colorado River. The cliffs are stable. There's no debris at the bottom of the cliffs. If it was millions of years of slow erosion, there should still be large amounts of debris or talus at the bottom of the cliffs, but they're not there. It's as if it was all swept away when the canyon was carved. And that makes sense. We know of examples of catastrophic erosion. On March 18, 1982, a mud flow from the sides of Mount St. Helens ripped its way 100 foot deep into a canyon system that formed 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. Then we know from, uh, from the evidence that in the Channel Scablands in the Pacific Northwest, 500 cubic miles of water burst through a natural dam and in 48 hours eroded out a 15,000 square miles area. So when was the Grand Canyon formed? Well, if we look at the evidence in the light of God's word, it's clear that as the flood waters retreated, the mountains rose, the valleys sank, and those waters would have drained off the plateau country that was rising up to rip off that 100,000 cubic miles of rock. And then as the water's flow receded and slowed down, it would start to carve a channel. But by that time, the plateau was so high, it was damming those receding flood waters to the east, making huge natural, natural dams. That dammed water was added to by post-flood rainfall, so that eventually the spillway of that natural dam overflowed, and a lot of water, a little bit of time, burst through and ripped out the Grand Canyon. So when we examine the evidence in God's world, in the light of God's word, we see agreement. And that's exactly what we'd expect because God is a true and faithful witness. What are some good questions to ask an evolutionist? It's often very important in a conversation with a critic of creation to ask the critic to define his or her terms. And so we might ask questions of clarification, such as what do you mean by the word evolution? The word evolution can simply mean change in a general sense. It can refer to the, the idea that organisms have evolved over uh, millions of years from one kind into another. It can mean the idea that organisms share a common ancestor. And so it's important that we define our terms before we begin the debate so that there's no confusion later on. We might ask, what do you mean by the word science? Science can simply mean knowledge in a general sense. It can mean knowledge acquired by the scientific method, for example. And so whether or not you classify evolution as science might depend on whether you're talking about operational science or origin science as another example. What do you mean by the word theory? Which can in ordinary language simply mean a conjecture, but in scientific language it actually means something that has uh, substantial support, something that has uh, evidence that would confirm it. In addition to these, there are questions that we can ask to get the critic to think through his basic worldview. And so you might ask, for example, uh, you know, do you believe that uh, single-celled organisms eventually evolved into more complex organisms? Yes, well, single-celled organisms reproduce by simply splitting in two, but whereas more complicated organisms, multicellular organisms, uh, reproduce differently. They have the male and the female. 
And so uh, by asking questions like that, it gets the, the evolutionists to start to think through some of the things that maybe he's taken for granted in the past. What about information in DNA? DNA has information, all the instructions necessary to produce you. It's a lot of instructions. Where did that information come from? Well, you see in the, um, if you read a book, well, it has information in it. You'd say, well, that, that information comes from a mind. Information, as far as we know, always goes back to a mind, brand new creative information. It can be copied many times, but it will ultimately have as a source an intelligence. And that makes sense given what the Bible says about creation. God made those first life forms and put, put the DNA, the instructions in their DNA. And so uh, it makes sense given what the Bible says, but it doesn't make sense if DNA came about by a random chance process. But ultimately, you must get back to what we, what we might call worldview questions. And these are questions that get the critic to think about his basic, most basic beliefs about the world, the way it is and how it came to be. Because we're going to find that in the evolutionary worldview, uh, you just can't account for those things that are necessary for knowledge. And so we must start asking questions about what's called epistemology, which is the, the theory of knowledge. How do we know what we know? And how is knowledge acquired? Do we go out and look at things? Is that how we acquire knowledge? Or, or do we, we do it by reasoning or some combination thereof? And why? Why is that the case? In the Christian worldview, God has made our minds. And so it makes sense that our minds would be able to acquire knowledge through a variety of different means, through thinking about it and through, um, through observing and ultimately through revelation from God himself. Or metaphysics, which is what is the nature of reality? What is the nature of the universe? Is the universe two? Is it, is it one? Is it, uh, is it many? And uh, so on. Now, in the Christian worldview, the universe is physical, but it's made by a God who is, who is beyond that universe. And so that's how we would answer that question as Christians. And finally, ethics, which is how we know right from wrong. And those are very good questions to ask an evolutionist because you see, ultimately, in an evolutionary worldview, you can't have an objective basis for morality. It's just not going to work because there is no, there's no God. In an atheistic universe, in an evolutionary universe where things have evolved by random chance, there's no reason why you should have a moral code, why those organisms should be obligated to follow a particular code of behavior. And so, for example, I might ask, uh, how do you know that it's wrong to lie? I mean, we would all agree that it's wrong to lie, at least generally. And why is that the case? Well, in the Christian worldview, I can make sense of that because God has told us that it's contrary to his nature to engage in lying. And so that is wrong. But in an evolutionary worldview, why would that be wrong? And so it seems that there's an inconsistency in the evolutionist worldview. On the one hand, he knows it's wrong to lie. On the other hand, he can't give a reason for why it's wrong to lie, particularly if it benefits my survival value. And so those are good questions to ask to get a person to think through his worldview. And if you're really good at asking worldview questions, you'll find that they actually end the debate because there aren't any good evolutionary answers to worldview type questions. Isn't the God of the Old Testament harsh, brutal, and downright evil? In today's culture, the Bible is under attack. And that shouldn't be a surprise to many Christians because the Bible's been under attack going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent, who was influenced by Satan, said, Did God really say? in context of not eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you know what? In today's day and age, the Bible specifically come under attack in Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11. And when we see these attacks come in, they're usually generated toward uh, creation versus evolution. And we can answer those questions fairly easily. But what we've seen is a turn then. People start attacking the Bible and they start attacking the character of God. And some of those examples are, isn't God a very harsh God? You know, how could he judge those innocent people in the flood? Or, you know, could God really send people to hell and these are some of those types of questions that we receive that are attacks on the character of God. Let's take a look at the flood for example. When it comes to the flood people say how could all those innocent people die in the flood but you know what were they really innocent? In Genesis chapter 6 the Lord says that the wickedness of man had become great on the earth that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil all the time. Man was becoming so sinful and the Lord basically gave him a countdown uh, and uh, he gave him about 120 years to count down to the flood to repent. In fact, his Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But you know what? They still perished in the flood. They were sinners and the Lord exercised judgment. But notice what the Lord did. The Lord sent Noah to build an ark of salvation in essence. People had the opportunity to get on the ark. Noah and his family were saved. Eight souls in all were saved on the ark. But see, the Lord provided a means of salvation. But would the Lord send people to hell? 
You know, I've had people come right up into my face and they point blank ask me, they say, do you think a good God is going to send all these people to hell? My answer is usually only if they sin. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all uh, failed to meet the expectation of God. And really, we all deserve to go to hell, uh, which is separation from God, the separation from all the goodness of God as well. And you know, the fascinating thing is that some of us will not end up in hell. And that all goes back to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, back in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, and we were in Adam and Eve when they sinned, we've all fallen short, going all the way back to that point. We all deserve to die right then and there. But you know what? We serve a God of grace, a God of love, and a God of mercy. And out of His love and out of His mercy, basically gave us a, a grace period. The Lord sacrificed animals to cover Adam and Eve, instead of Adam and Eve dying right then. And you know what? The, there were sacrifices from Adam and Eve, Abel offered fat portions, Noah offered sacrifices after the flood, the Israelites offered sacrifices, and they were all pointing toward Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate sacrifice. You see, the punishment from an infinite God deserves an infinite punishment. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is infinite, could take that punishment. Jesus stepped into history to save us from sin and death. Jesus took that punishment upon the cross, and He offers the free gift of salvation. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But why would people end up in hell? Because they're sinners. But take note that God offered a means of salvation in this as well.